Welcome back, Remodelites. Dave with Remodel Media, and I have a special guest on the show today. I've got Christina Smallhorn, and she has developed quite a following. She is a realtor out of Louisiana, and she specializes in affordable and or tiny homes. And we're going to get into some of that right now. Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. All right. So Christina and I actually originally connected on TikTok, actually. It is a very small world once you get into the area of content creation. That's what I'm finding. How about you? Very, very, very small world. And it's uh, great because you make people that are truly connected into what you're wanting to do, your mm -hmm. uh, line of, of content creation, and then you all become friends. <laughs> It doesn't take exactly. long. Exactly. I am a sucker for a good origin story. Can you tell me yours? How did you know you wanted to be a realtor? Thinking back, what are some of the earlier milestones that you said, yeah, I was probably going to be a realtor? I had a crappy, I had a good real estate agent and, and then I had a real crappy real estate agent. And I'm like, if I was a person trying to buy a house, that's, I want somebody like I had originally that good real estate agent. And so um, when I had that bad one, I'm like, wow. And we kept going through bad ones. We kept like one right after another. I was like, forget this. I need something better. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to do better for people than I got when I moved here. So I went awesome. ahead and got my license. Sort of a pay it forward kind of a thing, huh? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then um, as time went on, I realized um, being in this business that uh, there's a, a group of people that are literally treated differently because of the type of homes that they're buying, which is just disgusting to me. So that's how I kind of got into affordable housing. I didn't even know what I was going to get into once I got into it. <laughs> Can you dive into that a little bit more? Who is being treated differently and why? What do you see? So here in Louisiana, we sell a lot of manufactured homes. And when it comes to manufactured homes, the education on purchasing them is not there. There just isn't any. And um, so I made a few videos on YouTube uh, talking about how to purchase a manufactured home that you didn't necessarily have to have two separate mortgages that you could have a standard 30 year mortgage because um, in many cases they are told when they go purchase them off a lot that they have to have two mortgages one for the land and one for the manufactured home itself which isn't necessarily true which is going to cost them a lot more money and they're going to have to pay a higher interest rate um, to me, that's predatory lending. I think it's a terrible practice and there's nothing we can do to regulate it. The worst part about it is that the people that run a lot of the state regulations when it comes to manufactured housing are the same people that are selling them off the lots. Mm -hmm. So how does that really help the average person? It really doesn't. And manufactured homes get a bad name. They're, you know, they're like, I hear it all the time on my channel, like, uh, you know, what kind of people live in there? They have a preconceived judgment of the people that do own manufactured homes. Um, I've been set, told that they're tornado magnets. I've been told they're built like garbage. I mean, all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, have you guys even been in one since like, I don't know, 1987? Because they're not built like that anymore. They're not like that. What are you talking about? You know, they, and people don't know. So I just make as many educational videos as possible so people have an idea that maybe they shouldn't be renting an apartment maybe they should consider owning their own home and having a manufactured home um that's how it all started and then i got deeper as i got deeper into it there was always a confusion between manufactured homes and modular homes so i made more videos about that mm -hmm. and then i saw that more people were getting into tiny homes which you can get a tiny manufactured home you can get a tiny modular home you can get uh what they consult consider a pmrv and there's so many different terminologies when it comes to tiny homes so i helped educate people about that so it just PMR it's like a rabbit PMRV. hole PMRV. yeah pm what, what is a uh, pmrv a pmrv is actually a uh, a home like they call it a park model uh mm -hmm. recreational vehicle so it's it's a home like a tiny home that you see most of them you see are pmrvs and they're the ones that have wheels and they're designed to be traveled down the road not uh not for long distances and not always but, uh, not, but not most people road, don't. Road tripping. Right. But a lot of people, you know, well, it's for, you know, like a, like a good four to five month trip and then you bring it back home. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about it is that with a PMRV, a lot of parks 
uh, will not allow you to do long-term living use. In the design of a, of a PMRV, it is not intended for long-term living use. It says it's strictly on the... <laughs> Mm -hmm. on on the tags it says it's not meant for living use so um, I help people understand that if you are building a um, tiny home and you're gonna do this PMRV just know it's not designed to last you uh, you know 30 years what I've uh -huh. always been told about manufactured homes is they depreciate in value the land appreciates but the the actual manufactured home will depreciate with time is that true and not, and not in all cases no that's not true in all cases uh, if you go into places like New Jersey go into places around Arizona there's plenty of places in Florida you can have a manufactured home and you will definitely increase value it doesn't necessarily mean you wouldn't gain you would gain more value if you owned a home instead of a manufactured home, but it doesn't mean it's a depreciating value, and it isn't just the land underneath it. Um, matter of fact, I, I, if you ever look in the comment section of many of my videos, people are like, I just sold mine, and I bought it five years ago, and I gained $30,000 in equity, and it had nothing to do with the dirt. You know, it's like, really? in some cases, yes, that is going to be the case. And if you're buying a manufactured home in a park, most likely it's not attached to the land. You're probably renting the land underneath it. So yes, it would be a depreciating value because it isn't considered real property, and that would be a different type of loan. But um, you can gain value. It doesn't there isn't a standard that yes, you buy this and it's going to sink like a rock in their depreciating value. One of the worst quotes I've ever heard in my life was uh, from a guy named Dave Ramsey. I'm sure you've heard of him, and he says. <laughs> And he says, uh, why would you ever buy a car you'd sleep in? He calls mobile manufactured homes a car you sleep in. But I'm like, hey, I think that's a pretty crappy way of looking at things because why would you continue to rent from a landlord when you'll never, ever, ever own it? You know, like that's just stupid to me. Um, you know, in some cases, yes, you're going to lose money like a rock. There's plenty of people that put these in the wrong location. Um, just like any kind of building you, you put in, location is everything. They don't maintain the properties correctly. Um, the skirting comes off and they have lots of problems. Um, you know, just like anything, you maintain it, you will, you will win. If you don't, you're going to lose. <laughs> That's Absolutely. it. Tell me a little bit more about when you first started on YouTube. You, you had mentioned something earlier about doing skits and sketches and things like that. T tell me about that. Right. I'm a little goofy. I can't help it. Um, and when I was doing, when I started on YouTube, I didn't know what I was doing, first of all. And secondly of all, I was just, I was making videos that I found fun and funny because, you know, necess real estate information isn't necessarily the most like uh, riveting kind of stuff. And so um, I just was kind of like adding a little sketch in between the educational part of a real estate video. I still stand by those videos, uh, <laughs> but uh, I've just kind of shifted sure. gears over the years. I still add a little goofy here and there, you know, like you'll occasionally still catch me in a wig. <laughs> oh, for sure. My first videos were much lower quality. I didn't have a microphone or a, or a fancy camera. I just had my phone, which which nine times out of 10, I'm using my phone most of the time anyway, just because it's a full purpose studio in my pocket. My earlier videos were much lower in quality, but the message was there. Like my first viral video was how to pick a toilet. And the, the reality is for most folks, plumbing is a very dry subject, uh, pun intended. And it, it's hard to get people excited about it. You know, it's like, oh, I got to pick a toilet or a faucet. So being able to deliver that information in sort of an infotainment sort of a way is a valuable skill. Uh, That's funny that you say that. One of my good friends on YouTube, his name is Roger Wakefield, mm -hmm. and he has a whole channel about plumbing. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he just hit over 350,000 subscribers, and he's done that in like nearly a year. He like he awesome. went from like 100 to 350,000, but he uses info like an info education type of thing too, mm -hmm. where he is like reacting to TikToks that he's seen where people doing certain kinds of plumbing things. Or he'll, uh, you know, just any kind of reaction type videos uh, that come out about plumbing or something that he's seen. So yeah, I know. It took him a while to find his way trying to make plumbing exciting. <laughs> you know? And that's what I try to do with my real estate stuff, you know, just trying to make that as exciting as possible but still deliver good content and I will say it won't matter what kind of device you record it on I think people get that stuck in their head that they you have to have these fancy cameras in order to 
uh, put out good content, it's, it's irrelevant. Honestly, as long as the information that you're delivering is something that somebody wants to hear, you can film it on a potato. You know, yeah, people don't exactly. care. <laughs> yeah. Gary V is obviously everybody knows who Gary V is. He, he has this phrase that every once in a while echoes in my head. Uh, th this guy comes up and starts making basically excuses like a lot of people do. You know, I'm a perfectionist and I want to, I, I want to make sure what I put out is the best, the best representation of me. You all right? Yeah. I feel like sure that happened. Sorry. You go ahead. I'm so sorry. That's okay. He says, listen, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech was not filmed in high def, yet grade school children learn it to this day. So, you know, it, it's more about the message than it is the, you know, the quality of the video. Absolutely. Oh, that's, that is good. Man, mm -hmm. Gary, he says some good stuff. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. he's the whole reason why I started actually do a video in the first place. I had a, uh, I, I always have these bouts of uh, depression. I think that's pretty common with uh, creative people. And uh, I was laying in bed and he was like, he was doing one of his spiels and he said, if you're not recording, if you're not making video, putting out video content right now, He's like, you're, you're going to lose in, in five to mm -hmm. 10 years. You're going to, you're going to regret not taking the, the, uh, this opportunity that I'm telling you right now, which is to film something. And I was like, I'm a goofball. I can, I can film something. <laughs> I'll go ahead and do that. <laughs> yeah. I put out a video back in December, 2019. I published it on LinkedIn and this is before COVID and everything. And, and I said, there's going to come a time when 99% of the decisions people make about their remodel are going to be from the comfort of their own home. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I said, I, you know, it, it'll be in my lifetime. I could be 90 before it happens, but it'll be in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could look completely different than it does today. You know, VR goggles and the whole, you know, a virtual tour through a virtual showroom, see, touch and feel, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. But there's already technology that exists. Amazon has it, and a couple other vendors have. I think Gen Air, at one point they had it, I don't know if they still do, where you can literally take a picture of your kitchen and superimpose the image of the product over your kitchen so you can see how it would lay out, how it would look. So if augmented reality on your phone exists now, how long is it going to be before 99% of the shopping is done in-home? And, and that's, that's, that was the gist of the video that I put out there, a little three-minute thing. And then all of a sudden, COVID happened. Mm -hmm. And everybody was buying stuff from home. And we had this spike in home remodeling. I'm sure you saw some of it. Uh, people, you know, renovate, you know, they're sitting around looking at, like, I don't like this color. I don't, you know. Uh, and whether it's a, a fresh coat of paint or a complete remodel, People are making changes to their living space to make it more comfortable, and they're going online to find solutions to that. So, you know, when I first started doing this, I mean, people were generally either ambivalent or supportive, but there were a couple of people who, who told me, you know, you're doing what? You're putting videos out on YouTube? What? What? Why? Like, they, they just couldn't get it. And I've come to realize they probably never will, or or they they won't until it's too late. Yeah, I know. And uh, when I first started doing this, I got a lot of a lot of flack, a mm -hmm. lot of flack. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's like, who's laughing now? You know, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and um, even even in my own uh, you know field of real estate, when I first started. People were like, are you sure you want to put yourself out here like this? You know, are you sure? Like, you're going to turn off a lot of people by doing videos like this. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, I really honestly don't care. Those people I probably didn't want to work with anyway. I'm totally fine with not making the whole world happy. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So, yeah. anyway. So, I just went to the covering show, which is a, like a tile and stone show in uh, Orlando. And I was talking to some reps and things and the conversation came up that even in 2021 there's so many people that are still so camera shy it's it's almost amusing to me because i have reps that will sit down with me for hours and talk to me about their product but the minute you say hey 
let's make a video about it. They're like, oh, no, you know, like, have you have you seen anything like that? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, when I first started doing real estate videos, it was like this thing that Gary Vee was saying was to be a d digital mayor. So you basically mm -hmm. would go around and be like the host, but the, the star of the show was somebody in, in your local area um, where you would feature a restaurant or whatever. And I l would spend a day trying to convince people, local people, I didn't want anything mm -hmm. from other than their business and I didn't want any money or anything else. I just wanted their business. It was like I was spending more time trying to convince people to do that than actually do real estate. I was like, this is stupid. You know, I quit yeah. doing it. It was just dumb. Yeah. I just quit dumb doing it. I'm like, this digital mayor thing is not for real estate. I mean, I know many people that are in real estate that have done it and some of them have been successful, but more people have not been successful than been successful doing that. So, whatever. Now, a little birdie told me you've got an important event coming up in a couple of months that uh, you're, you're actually a keynote speaker. Tell, t tell the folks at home. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a featured speaker at Vid, the Vid Summit 2021. The conference, actually, I attended for the very first time in 2019. Of course, I planned on going in 2020, but, you know, the pandemonium happened. So, mm -hmm. um yeah, and then one day Daryl Eves just messaged me and said, "Hey, would you like to be a speaker at VidSum?" And I'm like, "Okay," and I've never spoken like this about YouTube. So, um, uh, my whole speech is just basically how to um, how I go from you know the ideation of a video to the point of publication, and then how I do live streaming. It's just a, it's it's a. It's almost like a guidebook exactly of what I do so that way I can get my videos uploaded and shared with the rest of the world. To talk about live streaming because that's that's still something that a lot of folks are either hesitant to start. Um, how, how do you go about deciding what topics to present? I, I assume with hundreds of thousands of followers, you at least have dozens of people in your live chat, right? Yeah, um, I get an average about like 200 to 600 people that show up mm -hmm. weekly. And, and we basically just talk about the housing market because it's, you know, real estate related. Um, I've, I've done live streaming from the time I really basically started YouTube. I used to have a real estate trivia show, which didn't wasn't very successful. I've had very different adaptations of live stream or found my way and now it's like I have a guest usually uh, on the show I um, will interview them or we'll talk about a, a news article that's come out and recently about the housing market and then um, people in the chat will ask their real estate questions and we have a full-on discussion about it um, some guests are better than others <laughs> and if I have a really good guest I have them on often so uh, yeah that, that's how it runs. I mean, it's very, very fun. And I do it for about an hour. Some people will live stream for hours. And I uh, mm -hmm. usually by the time I'm about to end, that's when I have the most, the highest amount of people on. But I know that for replay value, most people aren't going to watch. I'm, so, I'm shocked that they watch for an hour. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you get a lot of replays? And so I don't want to keep my guess. But. Yeah, about 30,000 30, replays oh, wow. after okay. after it's done. One question I really love to ask is, tell me about somebody who's adopted you, somebody who has helped you out along the way, especially when you were very small when you first started. Oh, there's some. Yeah. There's several people. Um, there's a When I first started, I would say the very first person that was like, you can do this, and I didn't even know who they were, was a guy named Miles Beckler. He, I mean, he would always just pop in on my videos. Another um, channel that, that really was helped me along the way was a VCG Construction on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy that runs that, his name is Vince, and he is awesome. He's always been very supportive. Um, there's a guy named, uh, his name, real name is Neil, but his channel is Urban Explorer. He, he my voiceover work and, um, been very supportive. Dusty Porter from the, um, YouTube Creator Hub podcast. And he also has a YouTube channel as well. It's super supportive. And then my most recent supportive person, uh, was, is Daryl Eve. So he's my mentor now on YouTube. I think you told me about Neil once before. Uh, he did the voiceover for a commercial that you made. Tell the folks yes, about that. Yes, yeah. Okay, I, um, I 
Umi to go to Vid Summit in 2019, I actually won a video creation contest and I wrote out the whole script and my friend Neil, who is from England, has a very good game show English accent and uh, I had him do the whole voiceover stuff. So he literally is the voice of that video, that commercial that I did, uh, like a, a good 90% of it and then the rest of it is just me saying one line. <laughs> Just silly, silly stuff. I made a, I made an infomercial and it won that contest. So, um, yeah, but Neil's a great guy. The, he the actually does a little, was really good. I, thank you. I, I, <laughs> I filmed it and edited it and did it all by myself. Um, but, um, Neil runs a, um, yeah, I do it all. I, I do everything. Wow. There isn't a thing I don't do myself. <laughs> so, so you said Neil runs a, um, he runs a uh, channel about van conversions where people mm -hmm. could live out of their van, basically. I mean, he has kitchens in there and um, he rebuilds. I've seen his and... channel. Yes. Yes, yes. I have. Because I was looking at converting a Suburban. I have a 1995 uh, GMC Suburban. My mom bought it brand new back in 95, ordered it from the factory. And it's got 300 plus thousand miles on it, and it is still going strong. So uh, very little maintenance. And I think we had to replace the transmission at one point. That was about it. And uh, I, I was looking at something I can do with that because it's obviously not a daily driver. It's a, you know, it's a gas guzzler. It's about, you know, 13 gallons to the mile. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it's... Uh, uh, but yeah, I, 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 and I actually came across his page when I was looking to, I haven't started that project yet. I'm still getting ideas, but yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with his stuff. He, uh, he, um, is a lot of self-taught himself, you know, um, he just kind of has that brain that can be like, okay, well, I'm just going to do it like this. And he, he gets it done, man. He really does. And there isn't, he's so detailed oriented by the time it's finished. You're like, man, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he has a really good you, you, you'll learn a lot from that one. <laughs> now, tell me about what, what was your very first, uh, tell me about your very, either your very first client or your very first job in the real estate market. Tell me about that. The first house I ever sold, you mean? Yeah, sure. Uh, I sold it to a, a young couple and I was like, it was the start of the worst housing market in, in U.S. history. Um, a lot of the agents had kind of bowed out because they were so depressed that the housing market was so bad. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just doing open houses every weekend and there was this full in um, that wanted to buy a house and they had recently gotten married after being divorced for a long period of time. So they got, got married and... Uh, uh, I found them a house. I mean, we just kept looking at houses after houses after houses. It was kind of a, a crazy thing that happened. Like uh, they were so excited. And at the end, the, um, the, the title wasn't correct. So we had to like, they had to actually wait over the weekend to move into their house, but the lady let her them move in. It was a, uh, that was the, one of the craziest sales I ever had. <laughs> Was that the craziest sale you've ever had or do you have you because mm -mm. that's also another question I love to ask is tell me about a project or something that went horribly wrong. Um, well, I wouldn't say horribly wrong, but I did or, show like or, or off the rails. I had I showed a house to that uh, looked at about 38 ha homes. Uh, been, we're, I'm still friends with them. I just love them to death. And then um, I've had like I had some crazy things. Anything that has to do with divorced couples or divorcing couples is always a nightmare. Uh, like, <laughs> and I did have a real estate agent that um, I had a how to under contract, and what she tried to do is try to get us to not be under contract anymore. And she would take steps because she had a buyer in the wings. So when we needed an extension, she lied and <laughs> she wouldn't extend out our contract. All we needed was two days so because she had another buyer. So she had her sellers wait an additional 35 days to close on it because she wanted to double in the deal. That was probably the, really? the uh, most awful thing that probably happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Real estate's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> people are, yeah. Um, be, people will try and get away with anything sometimes. So I had a couple I, that uh, I had a couple that ch uh, canceled a contract because their thirty no their sixty pound turtle didn't like the backyard. It was too mushy. 
well, yeah, I gotta take care of the pets, I guess. <laughs> so, um, when it comes to when it comes time to like remodel a home, what what are some things that you've seen folks try and sell or pass off? Have you seen any really crazy DIYs? Like, why did you do it like that? Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> um, like out that were kind of crazy with uh like the um where the gas line was mm -hmm. i'm like um yeah that's not not that that wasn't plumbed correctly you know <laughs> um, the gas line you, you cut out there for a second uh the gas line wasn't plumbed correctly you know they put it in the wrong place um mm -hmm. i w they're trying to bring water out to the outdoor kitchen and the, so they just use a garden hose to <laughs> stretch out the line um that's one way to do it, I electrical guess, stuff but... that's cur yeah, you know, just silly electrical stuff, not using the correct electrical tape, um, plumbing fixes that are, I mean, you name it, really, it's all over the place. Oh, for sure. Wood flooring that wasn't put down right, uh, they, they'll they put some kind of stick em stuff and throw it on the wood floors, and you're like, why is the, why is the floor, like, bouncing, and it has a sticky sound, and then, I, just, people are funny, people are funny. Yeah, the house we just bought in Virginia out here is, um, well, I, I'm sure you've seen the videos. It is not for the faint of heart, and it's probably going to need to be torn down and completely remodeled uh, or you know, built up from the ground up, probably. But I've noticed there's a lot of uh, like redneck wiring. Uh, yep. Like, technically, it works, but you're not supposed to do it like that. <laughs> like there's, there's one room where they, they completed the circuit by stretching another outlet and plugging the outlet into an extension cord to complete the circuit to power the rest of the room. It was crazy. It was weird. But, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've seen some interesting things in this house. Yeah, well, um, like flip properties. What years ago when people were flipping, everybody thought that they could have flip a house. I saw that more funny stuff then. You know, <laughs> people people think they're uh, like they're they're going to be like on a TV HGTV house flippers, and they'll paint cabinetry and they don't do it right. They didn't kill it, and it's already starting to bubble. You know, well, well whatever. <laughs> my my biggest gripe with HGTV is that they almost make they make it seem too easy and too affordable to do a lot of these projects I've noticed like there there will be yeah I won't pick on any one particular show because or even just HGTV DIY that whole just any DIY type show what what I notice will happen is they will grossly underestimate the budget and I, you know, they'll, they'll say, okay, and we're going to completely gut and remodel this kitchen for $10,000. And I'm looking at it like, uh, and then they show the end product. I'm like, that appliance package you just put in is half the budget. Yeah. How did you do that for $10,000? There's no way anybody at home is going to do this for ten. dollars You know, you, maybe fifteen, but even then it's like, you know, but yeah, you know, it's easy to do when the, you know, the host is the contractor. They're getting paid by the network, right? Yes. And, and, and oh, they just carried that Kohler box right in front of the camera with for that, you know, that paid right. advertising spot. And so Kohler donated the fixtures and, oh, Joe's plumbing is uh, pulling up in the driveway. There he is. Look at that TV spot for Joe. He didn't. He probably didn't charge much, if, if anything at all, for, for his services, and and so on and so forth. So, yeah, if you do all of that, yeah, you could get it done for $10,000. Everybody else is going to be at twenty minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, way minimum, especially mm -hmm. with the cost of uh, the building materials now. Everything is, oh, yeah. like, ha jacked up to the nth degree. I mean, well, oh, we can't lumber, even get yeah. roofing. We can't get roofing materials. We can't get lumber. I mean, thank God lumber is finally going down again. But I mean, it's still not anywhere near what it was a year ago. I mean, you got to cut that ha that price in half again in order to be at the prices we were over a year ago. Um, the the delay of supplies is is causing the biggest problem. Of course, every time you delay a project, that's costing you more money. So. Mm -hmm. uh, 
if you were on the fence of remodeling right now, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I would wait. I wait a little yeah. bit until we get these or, supply chain issues straight now. Or at the now. very least, wait until you have all the material. You don't right. Pull the that's, trigger until you have the material. That's why I, I always um, recommend uh, kit homes. So if someone was interested in building their own home, they could do a kit home where it has all the building materials already in it in one package. Tell me a little bit more about like kit homes. How are they built? Like I, I have not had the per uh, had the privilege of diving too deep into this yet okay well a kit home it's just a typical regular house just like you would build um but you like if you reference back to like the sears and robot houses everything you possibly need for a house everything including the crown molding doorknobs everything comes in one box uh, in the early 20s, 30s, and 40s, Sears and Roebuck used to bring them in on the trains. And you would have these freights of uh, lumber and and roofing reels and everything would come in there. And then it came with a instruction manual. They claimed that it would take about 90 days for it to be built. But some people said it took up to nine years to for it to build, be built. But they're extremely detailed, beautiful homes. And once they're completed, they're built to just regular standard building codes. So you'll be able to pass building inspection codes with them. Um, it is a DIY home. You're, not, you're going to have a hard time finding a contractor that's willing to put these together. Because they don't like to follow, they know how to build a house, so they're not going to follow what they have to say. And this is more like you put A into B and B into C, and you know, like they they give you full on instructions. As long as the instructions are not written by IKEA, I think I can follow it. <laughs> right, right, right. No, they're they're really self explanatory. And what the great thing about a lot of kit homes is that a lot of the pieces are manufactured in the plant ahead of time. So, like if you're building uh, walls and everything else, you might just be getting a package of walls. You know, like it's just literally you're just connecting the walls together. Um, so it eliminates that having to even hammer anything. That is. An intriguing concept. Yeah. Uh, I, and I'm willing to bet that there are some videos on your channel that help people dive into that. Huh? Yes, I do have I do have one about kit homes. There's a great company out in Utah called Zip Kit Homes. Currently, they're so far behind, though, they can't, they're not going to be able to deliver um, throughout the United States like they have been. They're only delivering right now in Utah and California at the moment. Somebody asked me on TikTok the other day, what's with all these delays? Is it real? And I said, I promise you, the entire remodeling industry did not conspire to deny you your faucets. I promise you that. It's, uh, and you know, in it, it isn't just a delay of the actual supplies itself because so, people will show lumber yards full of lumber, but it's not, there isn't, of course there's lumber, it's the shipping. And then a lot of the things that we come in for building, for instance, the, um, the asphalt shingles and all that come in a drywall, it comes from other countries. And every time a shipment comes into the United States from another country, they have to dock and quarantine for 14 days before they can start even docking and shipping all that stuff off the freights. So, I mean, there, there is a delay. 14 days is a long time to extra to add on to a project. So it's just backed up. It's just a backup. It's going to take some time before yeah, we work this uh, all out. I saw a video. I can't remember who it was, but the concept discussed in this video was, yes, these are COVID delays. COVID caused this crisis the same way an iceberg sank the Titanic or the straw broke the camel's back. In mm -hmm. other words, there were already other circumstances at play, you know, not enough lifeboats, you know, or an overloaded camel that uh, helped make it a bigger tragedy than it was, than it, than it could have been. Uh, that, that's the best analogy that I can think of because uh, the supply chain was already very fragile to begin with. You get an increased demand, a decreased supply, and everything just dominoes. And a lot of manufacturers shorten it to, it's a COVID delay. That's what they're really saying is, you know, it was just a perfect storm of circumstances that just... no, And nobody could account for that. The system. And nobody can count on that. How do you plan for something like that? Nobody mm -hmm. expects the world to shut down for a month, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it all happened so fast. It went from, you know, this is going to be fine to we're shutting down the planet, you know? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, And, you know, and we still... We're not out of the woods out of this by any means yet. Uh, we, we still have, um, well, and then, and then there's other ones that pop up all the time. And there's sure. countries that, like, Australia had been open for quite some time. Um, th are they a big exporter? No. But, still, like, they, there's still stuff that comes out of their country that comes into ours. Mm -hmm. 
and into other countries that they need their supplies in order to get our orders finished, you know, mm -hmm. um, they had just shut down again and they were, they had been open, no masks for months. Mm -hmm. And all it took was one person mm -hmm. to infect a whole hospital. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that they, was I mean, we're not that, out it was yet. something that uh, the shipping and the shipping costs as well are going up in a dramatic mm -hmm. way as well because that, that was something that came up with somebody at coverings. There, there was a guy at coverings that he was into, uh, he was actually in shipping and logistics. And, you know, he said that to get a container shipped, even just like from the ports in Florida to like central Florida, it used to cost him anywhere from 900 to 1200. Mm -hmm. uh, just last week, that same shipment cost him thirty eight hundred. So yeah, so shipping costs are going up. Which again, if it costs more to ship, it's going to cost more for the consumer to buy it. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, like everybody's like, oh, we have a shortage of people, you know, wanting to work, and it's not a shortage of people wanting to work. Honestly, the workforce, like a good chunk of it, stopped because of this. There's the people that retired early, and then there was people that got home and were like, you know what, I don't like my job anymore. I want to get re-educated, so came, they they got themselves a better education to get another job, and then we. Had people that have long-term health effects that have happened because they didn't get COVID and they can't do the job that they did before. So they had to do a different type of job. And then we have people that have to stay with family members because of the fact that they now are their in-home care and they can't work from home. Um, and then at the you know middle of the pandemic, plenty of moms were like, I can't, I have to stay home and teach my children. You know, like I'm their school teacher. I can't mm -hmm. go back to work. I have to, you know, teach my kids at home. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens in the fall, especially with all these new variants coming out. I'm interested to see what happens to the housing market. I'm interested to see what happens with building material costs. I'm interested to see how many people are get back to work. And I'm interested to see how they're going to handle this because we are all, we're all tired of this everybody's tired of this, you know, sure, and I don't know it. how yeah. nobody wants it. And so yeah. how are we going to be able to wrangle this up if this gets out of control again? That's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm extremely interested to see how this is going to turn out. Thank God I'm vaccinated. That's all I got to say. Yes. And I don't want to hear Same it. Way. If you're not vaccinated, yeah. I don't, I good, good, good on you. That's, uh, that's your business. But uh, if you, if you can, and you have the ability to get your vaccination. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that is an interesting thing. Something that nobody talks about, or few people talk about is everybody, talks about you know that we had 600,000 deaths but how many more people got permanently disabled or are now the caretaker of somebody who's permanently disabled or even partially disabled like, and a lot of elderly people that were close to retirement took early retirement because they're like mm -hmm. I'm not in this baloney forget this yeah. I'm not going back to the office I'll just take early retirement there mm -hmm. was a good portion of people that did that yeah absolutely so they're out yeah. of the workforce too I mean I was I feel guilty uh, a little bit when I say that 2020 was a good year for me because it was such a bad year for so many other people. But it was it was good in the sense that um, well you you followed my TikTok so you've seen some of my journey. But for the audience at home, I had a flood a little over a year ago, and I had an insurance payment because of it, and we took some of that insurance money and then we had some stimulus money. And everything and we were able to I was able to in December um, tender my resignation and commit to doing this and granted I don't make as much money doing this yet as I to replace what I did but I'm a much in Virginia I'm a much lower cost of living so I'm able to sort of uh, capitalize on that uh, it, it's a lot lower cost of living out here than it is out there. My registration for my car is going to be like $30 or something mm -hmm. like that. Whereas it would have been over 300, 400, you know, in, in California. So it's, yeah. I live in the South. You know, I live in, I live in South Louisiana mm -hmm. and, uh, the cost of living here is a lot less expensive than it was. And I lived in uh, cost of living there. They say, isn't that bad, but I can honestly tell you it's terrible. The cost of living in Florida, in central Florida is it's difficult. 
um, you have to drive to get everywhere. It's mm -hmm. hotter than heck, so you have to run your air conditioning. Your electricity and bill is astronomical for a little 1500 square foot house to run the air air during this was over 13 years ago we would have electric bills for a young couple that were 350 dollars a month for a 1500 square foot house and it was concrete block so it wasn't even like it shouldn't yeah. have cost that much and we then we would get a new air conditioning unit and then we like i was just mm -hmm. trying to do everything to make that bill less and it never was less never um, One year it was a robbery. California. Oh, insurance. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, the oh, homeowner's yeah. insurance in Florida is astronomical. It's mm -hmm. so high. Mar Anyways, go ahead. But I was going to say, one year in California when it was really hot, it was really bad. I remember one year we had a $900 monthly electric bill. $900 for one month. That's not even like we were behind and catching up. No, that was one month. Mm -mm. $900. So yeah, that's crazy. Got, you know, I just got my electric bill and, and we've been running the AC pretty regularly out here because it, it's not super hot. It, it's only, mm -hmm. let's see right now, like you might be able to see, I, I got a little schwitzer here, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, the high today is supposed to be 82. Uh, there's some humidity and that's a different issue. You live out in the middle of the woods. There's lots of, uh, Everything's very wet and there's lots of moisture in the air. But oh, don't uh, I live in the South Louisiana. Tell me about it. I feel like I get hit by a wet blanket every time I walk out the door. <laughs> oh my gosh. The first time I went to Louisiana, the when I about a year ago when I did my first road trip out here, I went through Louisiana and we had the AC going full blast in the trailer. So we pulled it never out, caught up, did it? But, uh, well, I put it in park. I pulled it into the gas station, put it in park, jumped out. Ex you you hit the nail on the head. Wet, a hot, wet blanket right to the face. Just a, <laughs> my glasses fogged up immediately. It was it was nuts. Like yeah. I've never walked outside and had my glasses fog up. That's usually something when it's like and your cold. clothes are wet. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and like walking into the gas station, like just water it's not raining but there's water dripping down the side of the window <laughs> i saw you and like you did that tiktok where you're in florida and you were crying about your glasses <laughs> getting fogged up and i'm like oh tell like yeah. oh boohoo welcome to south louisiana because it's 10 times worse than that 10 times worse mm -hmm. and, it, and you know like and then god forbid it actually rains like say it rains mm -hmm. like you have a really hot day like this with the humidity and then it rains in the afternoon and the sun comes back out it literally is exactly like a sauna, like exactly how a gym sauna feels is South Louisiana after a rain in the summer. It's terrible. It's oppressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> terrible heat. Terrible heat. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's not the heat. It's the humidity. That's what they say. So. Yeah. All right, Christina, you got any other projects you're working on? What, 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 what's up next for you? Um, right now I just, I just finished filming a video about, um, buying land for your home. Um, I talk, I talk all sorts of things you can do when you're trying to build your and buy your own home the most affordable way. So I just filmed that one. And, uh, this week coming up, I'm talking about, um, there's some headlines that have come out recently that are saying that there's going to be a wave of foreclosures that hits the market. And what does that really mean? Does it mean that the home prices are going to drop because of this? And when do you expect to see the these foreclosures actually hit the market. Um, I think people are going to be disappointed. The headlines do one thing, sell newspapers mm -hmm. and get clicks. It doesn't necessarily Absolutely. mean what it, what the headline says, that's for sure. So the wave of foreclosures that's coming, uh, I'm assuming it's people who've fallen behind on their rent or, yeah, because of, or on their mortgage because of COVID. Right. So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, about 4.4 million people signed up for the uh, the relief cares package to um, mortgage barents, forbearance relief package. And so um, and within that time, that's about half that amount. So we're about 2.2 million people that have either uh, that are that are currently on it. And um, 
they kept extending this out, extending this out, extending it out. And now they, they, they even extend it out for another month. So at this point, like for instance, if you had a mortgage right now, you could still sign up for the mortgage forbearance plan and then not have to pay your mortgage for about six, some six to 18 months. It depends on your mortgage carrier that how long they'll allow you to do this. Um, so what people don't understand and what most of these headlines don't tell you is that, uh, with, with a foreclosure, it takes an average, this is an average around the United States, a minimum average of about 427 days to actually hit the market. But the actual average is about 800 days. So even let's all these 2.2 million, 2 million uh, in forbearance, let's just say they all just don't pay their mortgage. It's mm -hmm. going to take eons before they hit the market. This is not the same kind of thing that happened with the last housing crash with the subprime mortgages. The reason we saw those hit the market so fast is that there were people in these subprime loans for years before the foreclosure nonsense started. We just happened, there were, it was a wave at the hit all at once. People had gotten over, extended themselves on their credit lines. The mortgage bear, uh, mortgage companies had given out too much credit on these and people had no skin in the game and they were willing to walk away and ruin their credit. Not the same in this market. Uh, the housing prices have increased not because of loans or funny loan packages. They're increased by cash. And a lot of these cash buyers are not buying their first house. They're buying their second house. And we have a lot of uh, corporate investors is coming up, buying up as many neighborhoods as they can to buy rental units. So um, it's pretty common that um, currently that there's a lot of hedge funds that are, are buying uh, real estate. Um, some People say that's the hogwash. They're only about 2% of the market, but I'm, I've am i seen it. I'm seeing it all over the place. And I had said it months before it ever hit the headlines. And then all of a sudden it was like all over the place. I'm like, I told you they've been doing this and nobody would listen. But now, now they're listening. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in a Facebook group called Leaving California because a, a friend of mine added me because he left California before I did. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot, like, I will say 99% of the people on there are, like, they're Republicans. And, and they're leaving, <laughs> they're, they're fleeing the California and stuff like that. I, and for me, so it's a little awkward for me because I'm like, guys, I just left because it was expensive. I'm not trying to be all of that, you know. I, you know, I, I, I just downsized my, my expenditures. That's all I did. Um, but, but that is a catalyst though. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe California is a catalyst because not only has the cost of living gotten to be so unaffordable for the person, they have the highest homeless rate throughout the United States and they have the worst, uh, uh, actionable steps that people, someone could take if they do end up homeless. You have a good portion of people that are actual teachers or, you know, just have good jobs. They can't afford to live, so they're living in their car. And there's no place for them to go. There's nothing, like, they're not addressing the issue. And I think that the rest of the United States should take a good, wide look at California and see if you can do it better because they're doing a crappy job. They're doing a really crappy job helping people get back on their feet. And as much tax money as that, that state pulls in, they could do a lot better than what they're doing. Oh, absolutely. 100%. I, I, I agree on that one. I've seen the homeless problem in California. I've let homeless people stay with me mm -hmm. you know, uh, twice. That you know, that, That's the funny thing is you, you start to speak empathetically about homeless people in a Facebook group or, or something like that. And immediately somebody responds with, well, why don't you have them live with you if you love them so much? And I respond with, I have. I have. I've given you people know, my home. What, I have, what, I have what, rental what properties. Yeah. yeah. I have rental properties and I gave rental properties to people that were displaced after um, the last the last flood, we had a huge flood here in 2016 and these people didn't know what the hell they were going to do and they were living paycheck to paycheck and now they're going to have to rent someplace because their house was flooded. I mean, they were on the verge of homelessness before this happened. So what do you do? You do the right thing. You give them a house to, for them to stay in until they get on their feet. Yeah. You know, I, don't yeah, be like, the thing is, karma is a real thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. For sure. For sure. All right, Christina, it was a good chat. Thank you for coming on the show. And Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, so is there anything else you want to plug before we go? 
Well, if you're interested in, in affordable housing options and you want to know more information about that, you can always visit my YouTube channel at Christina Smallhorn. It's Christina with a K. And just like the last name sounds, just small and horn. Smallhorn. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, Christina. Thank you very much. Thanks.